Hello. Uh, today we are keeping the theme of water movement, but we are keeping in or we are wandering off in quite a different direction because we are mostly talking about water going up and down instead of going round and round subtropical chires or coming up from the deep sea in terms of upwelling. Now this chap here is, in case you actually think I'm stark mad, Mad as a header, which is always the you know default position you need to take for every academic. Uh, this chap here is called Jeffrey Chaucer. Now Chaucer was a peculiar fellow, and he gave us quite a few, I should say, rather interesting uh, expressions in English, which still stay with us today. Now Chaucer was best known for oh come on, uh, you know. A few peculiar works in the Middle Ages. He was literally in the English language the most prolific, the best, you know, best known, you know, poet or writer of the ages. Now, I quite like that one. It's called the Parliament of Fowls. And the Parliament of Fowls basically mentions for the first time that two little turtle doves bring each other gifts, you know, when they want to make, you know, uh, baby doves, well, lay eggs, you know. Uh, and apparently that is the precursor of the modern custom of Valentine's Day. Now, Chaucer is best known, of course, for his work of the Canterbury Tales. Now, the Canterbury Tales is actually quite a good laugh if you actually read it. Uh, you should actually read something in a little bit of a more modern version. And it's this really, you know, peculiar characters going off on a pilgrimage and, you know, recalling their life stories. But that is actually not what we actually know Chaucer for. He coined, you know, phrases such as love is blind. Obviously, it must be, if you look at some people. He also like, oh, she was... Fair as is the rose in May, wrongly often in a slightly different form attributed to Shakespeare. He also said, like, by nature, men love newfangedness. I quite likely like that one. Um, and the guilty thing all talk is of themselves, peculiarly interesting. Uh, I can't possibly say next time you listen to what editions think about this one. Uh, he also said, the greatest scholars are not usually the wisest people. Obviously, when you look at me, complete rubbish, of course. But what he actually said, and this is uh, of relevance to our lecture today, is time and tide wait for no man. And that basically means, you know, you have to seize the opportunities when they arise. And we're going to talk about tides and now the rather voluminous and slightly preambulatory introduction hopefully makes some sense. Now, time and tide really wait for no man. Um, as you can see here in this rather magical uh, advertisement, which really makes you, you know, go back to France. Well, hopefully we can again. Um, once you would have the vaccinations, you know, let's cross fingers. Let's just watch this in you know, get yourself drawn into this tidal landscape here. vast mudflats and it is said that the lamb which grazes on the salt mud plants there produces you know the most flavoursome of the Normandy meat dishes but you know because of fortune but well versatile I actually reckon. Now 
I actually sort of like, hmm, you know, here we see the tide is in and the tide is out. Quite a stark difference, obviously. And I thought, ooh, let's look for an Australian example. And the only thing I could find, of course, you know, when you go like tidal movement on YouTube, the first thing which comes out is like those guys are here. Now, the reason why we're going to spend some time at the next 40 minutes or so explaining in great detail to you the concept of tides is that it always astonishes me that people live on the coast here and yet they actually do not have an understanding of what causes the water to go up and up up and up and quite predictably so and you can actually test it out go to any barbecue on a weekend and just sort of gently brought people in between the rugby, cricket, uh, talk. How good are the Queensland rest this season, aren't they? Um, I shouldn't really say that because I might actually use that lecture again next year and they might be bottom of the table again. No, they won't be. Any case, as a long-suffering red supporter, you know, next day we're going to beat the Brumbies. Right, where was I? So you can actually do this in between the sports talks and basically sort of ask, you know, hmm, can actually anybody explain to me, please, you know, why we actually have water level variation? And the answer is nobody can really. People say like, yeah, it has something to do with the tides, uh, with the moon. So they say, hmm, but it's actually different between spring tides and neap tides. Like, again, it's a moon phase thing. But... Essentially, here are the five in our key characteristics we need to bear in mind. It's a cyclic phenomenon, so it actually repeats itself. It goes over short time scales, so we're talking hours to days, not like decades or centuries, or actually, we're actually shortening that to years almost in the case of sea level rise. It is a variation in sea level at a specific place because tidal ranges and tidal patterns are very different in different types uh, parts of the world and we are talking about not just one force it's not only the moon we're talking about gravity inertia and the movement of the planets you know it's like the castle you know it's the vibe of the thing right so let's unpack all of that a little bit uh I couldn't really, you know, find a, a good analogy to, you know, a free wave and a forced wave, but there used to be this movie of this killer whale, you know, based on a true story. And I actually knew the guy who got actually paid for the whole lot. And, you know, when you really have a few beers together, you actually discover that all is not quite as it was uh, depicted in the movie, but nevertheless. Uh, so, really, essentially, he gets out of San Diego Zoo or some other aquarium where he had to do all sort of tricks to get the you know, uh, And eventually, he's freed. So, really, is free here. Uh, and uh, tides are essentially waves, but they're quite uh, a special type of wave in two aspects. Firstly, they are the world's single longest wave. Tides have a wavelength of half the circumference of the Earth, i.e. 20,000 kilometers, give or take, you know, 0.2 millimeters. Uh, we also need to bear in mind that many waves, and I actually just wrote about that yesterday in a paper which we're going to publish on, how waves uh, influence the amount of litter which uh, strands on the beach. Uh, that wind can generate waves and then those waves move away and they might hit the coast in two or three days time, many thousands of kilometers, you know, uh, away from the area that were generated. And so they have actually freed themselves from the forces which generated them. Now, tides cannot do that. They're always under the influence of the very forces which create them. So they are forced waves. Now, here is a bloke, you know, which we all know very well because much of our classic understanding of physics, which we still use today, uh, was done by a chap, you know, uh, who worked out 
the principles of universal you know, gravitational laws apparently based on an apple falling on his head. Here we go, boom, here is Isaac Newton. There's a bit of controversy really what Newton contributed really or which, you know, and what he actually stole uh, from Leibniz, who was a fellow mathematician uh, in Germany, but let's not go into that. Um, and so that kind of relationship between gravity, particularly the gravitational bull, except uh, exerted by the moon, was actually known to humans for quite a long time. Uh, to be exact, the Greek navigators noted that and they actually used it to go through there. Uh, Herculean Straits, the Straits of Hercules, the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar. That was a trivial pursuit question in the pub quiz on Wednesday, so I remember it. And essentially, you know, not much has really happened, and it took about 2,000 years for us to actually make any headway in understanding that better. But the one formula in that whole thing here, which you have to remember is, the gravitational attraction F is proportional to G, which is the gravitational constant, the mass of body 1 times the mass of body 2 divided by the square of the distance. So, all else being equal, gravitational attraction declines exponentially as you increase the distance between two bodies. And this is essentially Newton's most, you know, famous formula. And it's actually quite an old one. It's published in 1687 in his, you know, work, Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Uh, you, of course, you know, are required to actually uh, know all 600 pages of that by heart for the final exam in Latin. So why do I torture you with the gravitational formula here? Well, Newton said, you know, this is basically how I can explain time. And then the French said, no, 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 this is, you know, you know, um, you know, the tides are très difficile. Um, and here is a chap, you know, who's of course, dashingly looking like we all are. Uh, you know, all marine biologists and physicists, you know, not so much the mathematicians really, but never mind, uh, are dashing looking. And Laplace is basically the French equivalent of Newton, more or less in a, not quite in the same time, but in the same epoch. And he basically created fluid dynamics, which is the field of study, which explains how fluids, you know, basically move uh, in confined spaces. And two different schools of thought have developed. The one is the equilibrium theory of tides, and that one is the dynamic one. The simple one is the English one. The complicated one is the French one. Just like cooking, really. They always say, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the English can actually do some French cooking. They stand on the white cliffs of Dover with binoculars and look across the English channels and wish they could actually eat over there. But never mind. Uh, and essentially, the equilibrium theory of tides works on a very simple principle. We use... Newtonian physics, and we assume there's a planet which is uniformly, you know, covered by water. It doesn't have any of those annoying things called continents. And it's a static model, but oddly enough, it works. So if you actually buy yourself a little whip curl or what's the other one, Quicksilver, you know, tide watch, it's actually based on that very, very simple model. Uh, it's a harmonic model, and it actually is, for all intents and purposes, reasonably right. The dynamic one is basically the French version by Biasimo Laplace and this is what people use to forecast tidal levels and tidal times for specific places on coastlines taking the shape, the depths and so forth of the ocean basins into account. It's a real dynamic model, it's horribly complicated, highly mathematical, it's more accurate but if you just want to understand the basic principles, you're perfectly fine using this one here. And this is what we're going to use because, you know, I got a simple mind, so I can't possibly do the French mathematical stuff. Right. Uh, 
the first thing we need to actually keep in mind here is this, you know, great movement here. Uh, you should actually watch this for at least 17 hours. So, uh, and here we got the earth. I, I love it that it actually got a little bit of ocean war, you know. Uh, oops, you know, let's do this again. <laughs> uh, but what is actually very, very important is to note that the earth is, of course, going around the sun. Uh, we're not actually living under the jurisdiction of the Catholic Church anymore, unless you're in Ireland. Ireland. Um, and so we actually have the uh, heliocentric you know, view of the world, which basically means the sun is the center and the earth is going around. Now, around the earth then is the moon. It's going around you know, our planet. We just had a pink moon, which is rather, you know, fantastic. And both the Earth and the Moon are spinning on their own axis. So everything is actually basically in motion. That is the important thing. And the distances are quite different because the distance from the Sun to the Earth is much, much greater than the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So the Moon is actually very close to us, but it's actually small. And that's important to keep in mind. So it is basically this Earth-Moon system, right? The Earth is much bigger. The Moon is actually quite small. You know, I, I wonder how they actually managed to actually find it because it's so small. No, it's actually quite big. Yeah. And because uh, it is so much lighter and smaller, the center of mass of that combined system, the Earth and the Moon, is basically sitting in the middle here. And then at the bottom, you already see something quite odd here. And it basically talks about the combination of the Earth's attraction, uh, gravitational attraction, and inertia creates tidal bulges. Now let's unpack that a little bit. In the whole system here, of the Earth and the Moon spinning and rotating around the Sun, we have to differentiate two forces. Those two forces are actually part of that system, so you can't really you know, divorce them, but they have quite different effects on water movement. The one is called inertia, or the centrifugal force, and it is the outward flinging force, so it actually uh, moves water on the planet here away from the moon. You can actually see those vectors here. And the strength of this outward directed force is equal at all points on Earth, i.e. those vectors, if you actually ever go sailing and you try to work all these things out, you do a lot of vector drawings. Um, I always just sort of look at the sail and say, well, tell you how, let's go. Um, but that's just an empirical approach. I think sometimes one shouldn't really overcomplicate things when you do things for fun. Any case, uh, so those blue vectors are all the same. And the direction is also identical at all points of the Earth. So these ones are basically parallel. The second force is called gravity. Haha, Newton comes again. Now, unlike inertia, the strength of gravity and the direction is not the same at different points on the Earth. It is stronger on the near side of the Moon and it is weaker on the far side of the Moon. And everything points towards that center of gravity in that direction towards the Moon. Now, when you want to work out what is the net force, the resulting net force between inertia and gravity, you just basically do some vector additions. And you can do that here. And what you actually land up with is essentially those red uh, arrows here, which are called the attractive forces. Now, on the near side of the moon, Gravitation is stronger than inertia, and it essentially the attractive force is pulling uh, water mass 
on uh, near the equator there. And exactly the opposite happens on the other side. So we got one tidal bulge on the near side of the moon, and we got a tidal bulge on the opposing side. Now, even if you don't actually remember how the attractive forces work, what you have to remember in order to understand tides is that two bulges of water are created on the planet. And that is actually a true representation. Right, what happens next? What happens next is the following, that, um, here we go, we have another representation of that. And just imagine you sit on a, an island tropical island somewhere in the Pacific. Beautiful, and you might actually, you know, have just landed from the airport, takes a taxi, you know, walk down to the beach and say, oh, well, you know, there's a bit of beach. The tide must be out. Yeah, you can either be a tourist or you can be a Robinson Crusoe if you want it a little bit more romantic and with a little, you know, taste of world literature. Uh, or, you know, I actually looked at, you know, uh, Australian beach culture and that came up, which I thought was particularly uh, poignant. Uh, or, of course, you're up in Queensland. In, in Queensland, it's, of course, you know, men have sought out places to call their own. Very different, you know. The shed, in a car, under a car, on the playing field, or in the garden, the beer garden, that is. But no man, you see, into an unspoiled island with much, much more. Okay, whatever island you like, you know, let's assume, you know, you're on this island here. we got a little flex here, which I think is quite funny. And let's start at 6 in the morning. 6 in the morning, you might actually get up, uh, probably not feeling all that, you know, flesh. Uh, if you have been on 4X Island, and the water is quite high up. There's not a lot of, you know, basically beach. Now, the Earth turns eastwards, so what actually might actually happen is that essentially uh, at 12 o'clock, your island has actually gone up here around lunchtime, and the tide is out. And then, you know, you have a few more 4X, if you're on 4X island, you fall asleep, and then you rub your eyes again at about sunset and like, bloody hell, the water is back. And then it actually turns out again and it goes in and it goes out, it goes in and it goes out. So <coughs> what you basically assume here is, or what you observe here, I should say, is the water rises and it falls. It rises and it falls. But what actually happens is that the tidal bulge for that you know, time period of 24 hours here, stays more or less in position, and we're moving in out in <laughs> into a tidal bulge, and we're moving out of it. We're moving into one, and we're moving out of it. So and it, that repeats itself, you know, every day, religiously. So, yes, we observe the water to fall and to rise, but in reality, right, that observation comes from the fact that we basically move into an area of high water and into an area of low water. So it's all relative, but what actually matters is if you're actually on the beach, you know, the water falls and it rises. Now, uh, this is the same thing. So the next thing you then need to consider is what about then the moon going around the Earth because not only do, does the Earth spin on its own axis, not only does the Earth go around the Sun, but the Moon also goes around the Earth. Hellishly complicated, those planets. So let's have a, a quick look at this video here to explain you the different phases the of the Moon. Most likely you will notice the Moon. You will also notice that it doesn't look the same every night. Welcome to Moon Math and Science and the Phases of the Moon. 
The moon revolves around the Earth roughly every 27 days. As it revolves around the Earth, it goes through phases. Here's what these phases look like. But why does this happen? The sun, earth, and moon, along with their movements, causes the phases of the moon. The earth revolves around the sun, and the moon revolves around the earth. Let's take a look at this. The moon cycle, or lunar cycle, begins at new moon. Here's the alignment of new moon. And here's what new moon looks like from earth. And yes, it is very dark. The moon travels roughly 13 degrees in 24 hours. So after roughly Remember that the moon travels 13 degrees, 12.5, I think a little bit more, 12.75 per 24 hours. Waxing means that the sunlight is getting larger and crescent is the shape. And here's what it looks like. In seven days, the moon has now traveled 90 degrees and is at first quarter. Here's the alignment. Remember, the sunlight is always on the right in first quarter. I remember to be first, you must be right, and the light is on the right. Also, the shadow moves from right to left. In an additional 3.5 days, it is now traveled 135 degrees, and is at waxing gibbous. Check out this alignment. Gibbous is the shape, and remember, waxing means the light portion is growing. After 14 days since new moon, the moon has now traveled 180 degrees and is at full moon. Here's the alignment, and here's what a full moon looks like. After another 3.5 days, the moon is now at waning gibbous. Here's the alignment. Waning means the light is getting smaller. And here's what it looks like from Earth. Again, remember the shadow moves from right to left. After 21 days, the moon has now traveled 270 degrees and is at last quarter. Here's the alignment. The light is now on the left. And I remember, if you got last, you got left behind. After roughly 24 days, the moon is now at waning crescent. Remember, waning means the light is getting smaller. And the sun, earth, and moon alignment looks like this. And finally, after roughly 27 days, the moon is now back at new moon, and the lunar cycle will start over again. If you'd like to know more about the phases of the moon, this playlist will help. Thanks for watching. Right, so quite helpful little, you know, memory, you know, um, uh, post-it note, so to speak, in your brain to actually remember, you know, when it's vexing and raining. It's a little bit like when you go on a ship, you know, on a ship you never ever talk about, um, you know, left or right, it's port or it's starboard. And everybody has a different, you know, way of actually remembering that and translating it after a while it should actually, you know, be pretty much uh, uh, become, you know, second nature to you. Uh, I remember one of our instructors saying to us, you know, like, oh, well, when you sail from Cape Town to Turban, all the ports are on the left. And I kind of remember that. But, of course, in South Australia, I learned something, you know, quite different, uh, much more useful. And it basically says, so port is left. And when you're at a dinner party or even at sea, somebody says, is there any port left? You know, port as in port you can drink. Here we go. Uh, so... The moon goes around the Earth. Why is that important? Well, it is very, very important for two reasons. The first one is a lunar day is not quite the same as a solar day. We measure a solar day is 24 hours, which is basically the time it takes for a point on Earth to line up you know, with the sun again. However, while we basically turn uh, around our own axis, the moon also moves around us. And every time, uh, every day, it gets slightly ahead. As a matter of fact, it gets 12.2 degrees or, you know, uh, ahead every day. And it takes us an extra 50 minutes to basically catch up with it.
Now, if you consider the moon, in this example here, is the primary uh, force to generate the tides, of course, then our island, think about the island now, will have to actually move a little bit further along, which basically means every day uh, the high tides will be slightly lighter because we need to play catch up to the moon and it takes roughly an hour. So this is actually very, very useful. If you go next time on a trip to Double Island Point, Fraser Island, Morton Island, Strady, or wherever you choose to go, uh, you really only need to remember the tide time for day number one. I mean, there's lots of apps now which you can download on your phone. And then you can actually work out what the tide times will be on subsequent days because they're all offset by roughly an hour. Now, this is actually something I would actually remember because it might come in an exam. Didn't just say that. Did I? Mm. Okay, right. So, lunar day is different than solar day, and that makes the tides occur at different times every day, and that is a predictable offset of roughly 50 minutes to an hour. So here is the explanation of all of that. You can actually stop the video. It's also in your lecture notes, of course, which I have uploaded. Right. Here is another thing. Here is the Greek god Helios. Helios is, of course, the you know, Greek term for the sun. That's why we talk about heliocentric, which is basically our view of the world based on the sun being in the center of the universe, which of course, you know, got a few chaps into, you know, you know, very big, you know, problems with the Catholic Church to the point of them being killed. So don't mess with the church, you know. Well, I hope it's not too bad anymore, but, you know, uh, as scientists, we do actually, uh, you know, uh, believe in the heliocentric uh, uh, arrangement of the planets and that bearded uh, man or whatever he may look like or, the, you know, big spaghetti monster in the sky or whatever it may be, that's a personal matter of belief, but it's not science. Okay, let's not get me saying that. I'm not saying it's wrong. All I'm saying is they're quite different things. Now... Theoretically, the sun should have a much, much bigger influence of, on the tides because its gravitational attraction is massively larger if we only would consider the... Uh, okay, I was just checking the microphone. Uh, if you would only uh, consider the mass of the sun. It's 27 million times heavier than the moon. Right. However, the sun's influence is roughly that of uh, the moon because it's 400 times further away. So you might say, oh, 400 times further away, 27 times million? It doesn't really work out. Well, remember the gravitational attraction between any two bodies declines with the square of the distance. That is the trick here. The further you go away, the sharper it actually, it, it actually falls exponentially away. Now, that means two things. I showed you that video of uh, the moon going around the Earth in the different moon phases because at new moon and at full moon, the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon are in alignment. So they add up. It's an additive force, i.e. the solar tide sits on top of the lunar tide, which basically means high tides are a lot higher and low tides are a lot lower. At first quarter moon and at third quarter moon, we refer to those times as the neap tide, the solar tide is at a right angle to the lunar tide. I wouldn't say they cancel each other out, but basically the planet is more uniformly covered by water. Which basically means at neap tides, i.e. first quarter moon, 
and third quarter moon, we have much lower tidal variation. Here we go. So here's a typically tidal graph over a lunar month, and you can see spring tides. It could be, you know, basically the new moon. Then we have the first quarter, full moon, uh, uh, third quarter, and you can see very large tidal variations during spring tides and smaller tidal variations during neap tides. Now every, you know, most points on Earth have roughly two spring and two neap tides per lunar months, and they are, roughly speaking, offset, you know, by a week, you know, to go from spring to neap, from neap to spring, from spring to neap, as you can see above here. And all else being equal, we find that tidal variation is higher during spring tides. Now here's an emperor, of course that's the young Austrian emperor, uh, I think uh, that's Franz the first. Uh, yeah, this guy, uh, Pierre Philippe, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, the pure British people, well, hello, oh, sorry, you know, uh, the Australians are still subjects, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So maybe not so much a queen uh, or the king, but let me not get started on that. Um, I might actually have to call upon Malcolm Turnbull to actually help me out here a little bit. Uh, he is, of course, a superb king, king of the island. Uh, what I want to say here, here is the king of the Tahitians, as you know, he basically you know, met uh, uh, James Cook doing you know some of those Pacific voyages. Now. We are quite often, uh, you know, you hear on the radio here like, oh, there's, there's going to be king tides and everybody gets terribly nervous, you know, about the king tides. And I often wonder, like, what is going on with king tides? And basically, it is sort of a popular usage. It's a colloquialism, which refers in Australia to any situation where tidal levels are unusually high. But it's not a scientific term. And it is, in most instances, actually rather unhelpful. So when you actually are in the company of empirical scientists working with the ocean, you know, it's actually better not to actually use it. Now, we are finishing this lecture with something uh, which I say right from the outset has nothing to do with tides, but I have to put it in because... It is by 99% of news readers and journals and common people. Uh, that's common people. Common people are always a pain in the back, so not the, the peasants, you know. Uh, is that, you know, everybody, you know, uses a completely wrong term. And we refer to those kind of horrible, absolutely, you know, when you actually watch these things, because you actually have to consider in those events, people die and often quite a lot and livelihoods get destroyed and it's just, and you know, not much can be done about that. Uh, people actually talk about tidal waves. Here's a tsunami, one of the bigger ones in Japan. Now, let's have a look at this. Now, when I watch this, and I've seen it quite a few times now, I, you know, I, I have to say, you know, I, every single time I feel very, very uneasy. It's it's frightful, and it's tragic to watch it. It, it is really a sort of, and it gives some goosebumps every time. When you see a wall of water advancing, this is actually the uh, Japanese uh, a tsunami of 2011. And there is nothing, there is bugger all you can do. Well, the Japan, uh, Japanese now. Uh, and, 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 and you can almost hear the drama, the panic in the newscaster's wife. Now, most of those, you know, ocean waves, of course, get get closer. Look at this. This is just, it's just awful. Yeah. And I'm only putting this here for two reasons. The destructive power is is so enormous. It basically everything else which we do 
uh, which we experience on Earth, other than massive earthquakes. You know, we talk, we, we talk about bushfires in Australia. Yes, very, very tragic. But this is a scale you cannot even imagine unless, you know, one, unfor you know, fortunately never sort of experiences that. And so what actually happens here? Why does the ocean produce waves which come onto land to become completely and utterly, utterly destructive? Well, um, let's have a look. Those extreme waves are called tsunamis. And very, very often people use the word tsunami in the same sentence as tidal waves, but it's a complete misnomer. It has nothing, a tsunami has nothing to do with tidal waves. And essentially they are formed by any sudden formation of the seafloor. It can be earthquakes, submarine landslides, submarine uh, volcanic eruptions. So basically there are seismic phenomena and that's why the proper term for a tsunami is a seismic sea wave. They can have enormously long wavelengths, up to 100 kilometers between peak to peak. But in the open ocean, they're actually quite low, a meter or so. I remember once we sat uh, about 20 kilometers offshore in a, in a quite small boat off of Nandi in, in Fiji on the west coast. And we heard on the radio, we got radio then, like, oh, there's a tsunami warning. And, you know, I was, you know, uh, not terribly experienced with tsunamis at all. And we're like, oh, my God, you know, what's going to happen? And basically it was like, well, you know, we are, you know, over 4,000 meters of water, nothing is going to happen. Um, you know, we didn't even know it, like, we just bloop, you know. And luckily that tsunami actually bypassed the island, so we got actually very, very lucky. They travel extremely fast. They can cross an entire ocean in uh, ocean basin in a day or two. And here is the run. It is very, very difficult to predict what a tsunami will actually do once it actually enters the continental shelf and shallow waters because they can essentially slow down and they build up to enormously long broad wave fronts and enormously high and they can keep on going. And that's just devastating. And here we see a tsunami propagating from uh, a seismic event in Chile and it goes all the way up to Japan. The, the 2011 uh, uh, Japanese uh, tsunami was a more uh, local offshore event. Here is a guy, I quite like that. Sometimes simple observations or simple explanations, you know, or, or models can actually work really well. And he basically built this thing to actually explain how a, a tsunami works or how it is actually generated using something he made in his shed. Let's have a look at this one. Earthquakes are caused by the movement of the huge tectonic plates that continents sit on. What happens is they come together, one, in this case, the Pacific plate is moving below the Japanese or Eurasian plate, and it causes that plate to bend when it sticks there. There'll be a bit too much friction, it'll stick, pressure builds up until suddenly it's released a flip. Have a look at this. Now this is the tectonic plate that Japan is sat on. Science is such fun, especially if you can do it in the shed. I think every scientist at USC should be given a shed with lots of tools and land rovers in it. Energy of the moving together gets translated to strain energy, literally flex and bend in these huge slabs of rock. Our energy builds and builds, they're flexing and bending more and more. When they finally slip, that stored energy... All now think about those two blades. Remember our lectures on blade tectonics? They're talking about thousands of square kilometers. So there's a lot of volume being displaced because it is a very large area of ocean floor. So it only needs to actually lift you know, 10 meters or so to actually create a large volume change. So here we've got a bigger submarine version of what's going on. 
This gives a representation of what's been happening 24 kilometers below the ocean surface in the Japan Trench. And these things work in what they call a stick-slip way. Most of the time they're stuck, but occasionally they slip. And that's what an earthquake is. So we've got it here, this, this is bent up here, full of pent up energy, waiting to slip. And when the slip happens, that energy gets released into the ocean, causing a series of tsunami waves, moving in both directions across the Pacific. Right, so, you know, here is... Earthquakes are caused. Here is a word of warning. Uh, if you actually just Google tsunami or even seismic sea waves, there is a lot of rubbish out there. Uh, I think it's just one of those things, you know, where people really love to, uh, you know, you know, hone their video editing skills. So you have to be quite careful of the information you really, really consume. Uh, the best one I actually did find was the one from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency, NOAA in the United States, and here's the web address. And, you know, you can actually watch lots of uh, tsunami models. Now, here is one actually emanating out of, uh, propagating out of uh, Japan. Of course, that's... And here is another thing called, you know, what do we do with a tsunami when a tsunami strikes? Right. In the Pacific, we are very, very fortunate that the Americans have built, with the help of a few other of the surrounding uh, governments, but we haven't really contributed terribly much in Australia, a very, very good uh, tsunami network. And they had to because Hawaii historically had very, very large tsunamis. Now, if you are anywhere, right, where there is a present tsunami warning and they say, evacuate, do it, uh, there is just no basically complacency, you know, which make you actually seem like being particularly cool. Keep calm and do whatever the authorities do, because quite often it is actually not 100% predictable, you know, what a tsunami will do. And I'm saying this because a few years ago, well, about 15 years ago, some of, some of the older folks like me might still uh, remember that, that we had a tsunami warning in Mululuba, and the most bizarre thing happened. People, and I kid you not, people actually went down to the beach to wait for the wave to come in and photograph it. I mean, and the police didn't chase them away because we never actually have terrible many of them because our continental shaft goes very far out. And, and basically our continental plate boundary, you know, goes, you know, 2,000 kilometers to the east and all around us. But it could actually happen. So stay calm and do exactly, you know, what the authorities do. Uh, so tsunamis are not tidal wave. They're seismic sea waves. And they have nothing, neither in the way they get generated, nor in the way they behave, got to do with tides. The tides are predictable, right? There's very, very little variation other than a storm setup or whatever. Uh, but tsunamis are usually a very different beast. Right. So we basically conclude, you know, with the word English, basically stiff up a lip when it comes to, you know, tides and tsunamis. And I see you in a week's time or... Oh, what's the next one? Oh, I have to think about it.